Okay, alam niyo ba na kilala niyo ba si ang ating panahon niyo? Ha? Kilala niyo ba siya? Napanood niyo na ba siya? Yes! Kasi siya napanood? Sa TV, sa YouTube? So, kung ang magdana, anong pangalaman ang ating susing tagapagsalita sa araw na ito? Ginoong Travis Ka. Philippines, and it sounds like Philippines, 
Philippians, it spells so many Philippians, and uh, the Philippians, those must be the people that come from the Philippines. I know it sounds silly, and I was thinking, well, why, why is this in the Bible? These people look Chinese in the pictures to me. And I was thinking, did Jesus go to China? <laughs> Apparently he did, I'm no expert. <laughs> so, that was my first exposure. I didn't really think of it again for a few years. While I was in high school, I was on the wrestling team, doing really well. I was always nationally ranked. I was winning state championships. And I got a lot of attention because of my excellence as an athlete. I even got media attention because coming from a smaller town, there's no professional sports teams. There's no big colleges. So in my town, if you're a high school sports star, it's like you're a little bit of a celebrity. So I would get these articles and these TV stories done in the local media about me, and I would think to myself, this is just the beginning. Like someday, I'm gonna move to Hollywood, and I'm gonna be this big shot actor guy, because that's what I was always fantasizing about. So because of my wrestling ability, a lot of colleges were recruiting me, trying to get me to go to their school so I could wrestle for their team. And I really had my heart set on going to college in California. And one school that was recruiting me heavily that I had a lot of interest in was Stanford. How many of you have heard of Stanford University? Yeah. It's one of the most prestigious schools in the United States. And in high school, I was thinking, okay, I'm just going to get a wrestling scholarship, move, that's how I get to California. And then after college, I started getting into the athlete stuff. And Stanford had interest in me, but the thing was, since I was just so focused on acting, I let my grades slip a little bit senior year. And they had very, very high standards in terms of grades. They kind of lost interest. They said, we know you're a great wrestler, but some of your test scores, they were kind of average, and your grades slipped. I just didn't take it seriously. I didn't know at that time. I wasn't thinking about that kind of thing. But there were still a lot of big major universities interested in me around the country. They just weren't in California. I ended up going to a school in Michigan which is a long ways away from North Dakota, and it's quite a culture shock when I got out to Michigan. All this time, I had like, kind of forgotten that article a little bit about the Philippines. I ended up going to college in Michigan on wrestling scholarship. I was actually gonna major in theater to learn to become an actor. Well, I got in my first theater class, and I thought to myself, geez, the people into this stuff, they're kind of weird. And the teacher is there. I don't know what to make of these people. I was coming from a very straight laced background in North Dakota where the men are really men and that kind of thing. And so then I looked at the film department and I said, you know what? I'm more into film. I'm not into plays. I'm not into theater. I'll get into the film department. A lot of people in that, they, they're quirky. A lot of those people are nerdy, but I have my nerdy side, so I fit really well in with them. And during this time while I was in college, I was on the wrestling team going to school, pursuing my film degree. I met, a, I met an older lady who was about 60 years old, and I became friends with her. This lady was from a country called the Philippines. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's over in China, right? And she said, no, not exactly. And she said, are you hungry? Typical, I didn't know about Filipino culture. She said, are you hungry? And I said, yeah, being a college student, I was always hungry, and I didn't want to have to pay for my own food because you don't have a lot of money. So she kept feeding me, and because of that, we started hanging out and talking. And I would ask her questions about where she's from. And I said, she, she told me one time, oh, I gotta go to church. And I'm like, oh, like temple or something? And I was thinking she was a Buddhist. <laughs> she goes, I'm now I'm going to a Catholic church. And I said, oh, well, that must be uncommon where you're from. I thought you, I thought you worshiped the statues of Buddha. And she said, no, in my country, most people are Christians, and most of those are Catholics. And I thought, oh, that's crazy, I didn't know. And then she showed me where the Philippines was on the map, and I saw their islands. And I'm like, I had no idea that they were even islands. And she also informed me that the United States used to actually own the Philippines. I had no idea. Even though in high school in America, we studied World War II extensively, and the Philippines was a big part of World War II, they never mentioned that. The only thing they talked about in our wars with Japan was they dropped bombs in Pearl Harbor, and then America later on dropped atomic bombs in Japan, and that's it. When they study World War II in American schools, which is extensive, it's all about what goes on in Europe. It's all about the Germans and the Nazis, and that, that's all they learned, really. I didn't know the Philippines was involved in World War II, played such a major part of it. 
But through my friendship with this woman, I kept asking questions. Then I started going to the library and checking out books about the Philippines. And I started looking it up on the internet. And I was thinking, boy, this place really sounds interesting. I've always been interested in Asia, but I've never heard of this place. I, I really, this place seems fascinating. It turns out, after college, I, I finished my degree and everything. After college, I ended up taking a trip to Asia. It was a month and a half trip. But the first stop I made trip go, the Philippines. I was gonna spend three weeks in the Philippines, one week in Thailand, after that, one week in Korea, one week in Japan. I was interested in all those places, but I went to the Philippines for three weeks. And I didn't I had expectations. I honestly I thought it was gonna be nothing but a tropical island paradise. <laughs> When I flew into the airport, I get off the plane, I step outside, it's about 10 p.m. at night, dark, and I walk outside, and like a punch in the face, the heat and humidity hit me. And I'm like, boy, it's nighttime, the sun's up, and it's this hot, and I'm sweating immediately. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, okay. Then I get in a car, and I'm going to a hotel in Makati, and I'm looking around. Keep in mind, I thought this was going to be some sort of tropical island paradise, and I thought it was, I thought the people in the Philippines were going to be just like Americans. I heard they all spoke English. I heard they were going to sound just like me. And they have all the same things. The only difference is they're going to look different physically. Riding into the airport, that's when it hit me. I was looking around, and I was looking at all the people in the streets. Like how dirty it was, the pollution. And it blew my mind. I'm like, this isn't what I expected. <laughs> I was thinking it was going to be something more like the line. And I've seen all this poverty in the streets, and this dirtiness, and I was thinking, man, this place looks like Detroit with palm trees. <laughs> and then you know what Detroit looks like, it's not even it. So I get to my hotel, and I check in, and I've been amped up for a few years now to see the Philippines, and even though I hadn't slept at all on a long plane ride that was over 20 hours, I couldn't sleep. I was psyched. I get to the hotel, I check in, I drop my bags up, I would leave the hotel even though it's about midnight or so, and I start walking around Makati because I, I have to see this place for myself. And all of a sudden, I see a guy, I thought, there's no one on the streets except for one guy, and he's following me around. And, you know, coming from America, if a guy's following you, that's a sign that there's going to be some big trouble, some stuff's going to go down. So I see this guy following me, and I'm like, oh, okay, this guy must be wanting to jump me or harm me in some way. <laughs> and I cut back to the hotel, and then I went up the next day, and I saw how friendly people were. Looking back on it, that guy, I doubt he wanted to hurt me. <laughs> he was probably just fascinated by a foreigner coming, especially a young foreigner. You don't see a lot of young white people. I'm assuming it had something to do with that as opposed to trying to do some sort of harm to me. But when I left the next morning, my friend that I met in college, her relatives were showing me around, and it was a lot different than I expected. Like I said, I thought people were going to speak English here the way I speak English. Perfect American English. That's really what I thought. And I got a shock. It turns out half the people in the country speak English really well. And of those half the people, they speak English pretty much like Americans. But the other 50% of the country, most of those speak little to no English. And I'm like, well, I thought everyone spoke English, but it's not that big of a problem because if I, if I need something, I turn to the person on my right, they don't speak English. Oh well, just turn to the person on my left, they can help me out and they'll speak pretty far. <laughs> so it wasn't quite as I expected. But during this three week time, I met so many friendly people, I had so many amazing experiences, it blew my mind. I had high expectations before coming to the Philippines the first time, and even they blew away my high expectations. I had so much fun. After that, I went to Thailand, and I thought, Thailand's great, but it sure ain't the Philippines. And I went to Korea, and I thought, this is great, but it sure ain't the Philippines. I went to Japan, and I'm like, this definitely ain't the Philippines, in terms of friendliness. So, I got back from my trip, and it just, it really changed my life, seeing the Philippines and opening my eyes to how friendly and nice people could be here. Growing up in North Dakota, that's probably the friendliest part of the United States, and the Philippines is so much more friendly than that. I just couldn't forget it, but I loaded up my car, because the whole plan was to move to Hollywood, get into acting and all that. So I loaded up my car, drive to California, and for a couple years, I'm trying to get in, Thing, some things are happening. 
I started getting into modeling. That kind of just came naturally to me. And then I started focusing on that one. I should have been focusing more on the acting. But I, I started to get in. I started to get some, book some good jobs in, in Hollywood. But the Philippines was always in my mind. I always wanted to visit. The whole time I was there and I was having fun in California, I just kept thinking about the Philippines. So after about a year and a half, two years in California, I got together some money. I flew back to the Philippines. But before coming this time, since I was getting experience already as a model and actor in California, I thought to myself, maybe I can do some stuff in the Philippines. The Philippines does some good stuff, especially with magazines. I can get some, get, get some big project, take that back to America, and that'll help me even when I get back. So I fly to the Philippines at the end of 2005. And I didn't know anyone here really. I didn't know anyone in entertainment here. I didn't know what was going to happen, but I figured something's going to come from this. Well, my first week there, I actually meet a guy that becomes my best friend from right here in Green Hills, who was also working as an entertainer, and he was really nice to me. This is my first week, but also during that first week, I had my first bad experience in the Philippines. And this is actually the first time I'm going to share this publicly. Because I love the Philippines so much, I don't want to share this with my foreign friends, because I don't want to scare them away. But it turns out, I'm walking down the street in Makati, and to make a long story short, some police surround me and they accuse me of a crime I didn't commit. <laughs> and it was a very serious crime too. And I was still kind of thinking, uh, it's like America, you know, they can't really do anything. I, mean, I obviously didn't do what they're abusing me of, but they said, let's go to the station and talk to our captain. And I had the attitude, it's like America. I said, oh yeah, let's go to the station. We'll scrape this mess right out. <laughs> well, I get to the station, I meet the police captain. Well, I notice things aren't getting better, they're getting worse. He comes out and he starts telling me, you're going to be thrown in jail. I didn't understand the culture, I didn't know what was going on. Uh, people later told me the real deal was, I was expected to bribe the policeman when they first stopped me, just so they would get going. I had no idea because in America, it's very risky to try and bribe a policeman. They're going to want a lot of money and it's probably not going to work, you're going to be in a lot worse trouble. But I had no idea. But I started calling my friend, and for, for whatever reason, he wasn't available. He wouldn't answer his phone, and I'm freaking out. But then I, I had still had the phone number of my friend's relatives that lived here, and I, I, I ran out of load. The policeman sitting at the, at the phone in the station, I said, can you call this number for me? It's my relatives. And he said, are your relatives Filipino? And I said, yes, they are. And then all of a sudden, all the policemen, man, like magic, the policemen that were talking about how they're going to arrest me and throw me in jail for life, all of a sudden their faces changed. It was very strange. He called and he said, yeah, we have your relative here. We had, he's, he's accused of a crime. Can you come down here? He wants you to stop by. And uh, all, as soon as he hangs up the phone, the police captain that was threatening me, telling me that they're going to throw me in jail, he comes over and he puts his arm around me and says, you know why we really brought you here? We want to warn you of the dangers of the Philippines. We want you to have a good safe trip here. He just wants to make a ball and stay safe. He said, you like that? Like, so I'm not in trouble? And he said, no, you're not in trouble. Are you crazy? Like, you're our friend. He said, we just need you to sign this piece of paper. They got a notepad and they wrote down, no police tried to harass me or threaten me. I said, just sign your name there. And uh, your relatives can come get you. And I signed my name, and I, I said, uh, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna run down to the store. And then I said, you going to wait for your relatives? And I, I said, no, I'm going to get this load. I didn't want to wait around in case they changed their mind and decided to arrest me. <laughs> so that was my first bad experience. And then two days after that, I had another bad experience in the Philippines. I, I, was, with, I was with a girl that was working for my friend, and we took one of the horse rides around the the uh, Manila Bay area, and we got in one, I, I, I got with the guy, I said, how much is it? He said, 50 pesos. I said, okay, cool. And we got in a ride, and then he said, it's going to be 500 pesos. And I'm like, that's not what we agreed on, just let me off. And then he starts going faster, and he goes, no, you can't get off. So we had a little issue with that. So I had a bad first week back in the Philippines, and I thought, wow, I was so wrong about this place that I love. This place is terrible. I just need to go back early. I, this place isn't for me. But for whatever reason, I stuck it out. It turns out those were very isolated incidents. And since those incidents, this is 
late 2005, I haven't had any experiences like that again. So, I appreciate that. But I stayed here, and I did start to get into entertainment. I didn't do some of the things that I thought I would do. I did things that were even better. I started acting on some TV shows. I wasn't the star of the show, but it was my first time getting really decent acting roles. And I, I ended up shooting all these billboards, and I had all these billboards along Edsa, huge billboards. And I never planned on that, so it was a very neat experience. I was supposed to be here for five weeks, was what my, my trip was scheduled for. I ended up staying for nine months, and at the end of the nine months, I was so sad to leave. But I forced myself to leave because I'm like, no, I'm missing out, I gotta get back to Hollywood, I gotta go work on my career again in America. So I fly back to America after nine months, and it's time to get down to business. I find myself a Hollywood manager. And this is a guy who, who is credible, and it turns out we had some disagreements. Looking back on it, he was right, I was wrong, I should have listened to more of his advice. But I thought, this guy's trying to turn me into something I'm not, I don't, really don't see myself that way. And I ended up staying, in a, during this time period, it was the worst time period of my career. I only booked one job, and it was a low-paying job, and it was kind of depressing. After seven months, my manager calls me up and he says, you know what, you're not booking gigs, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid there's nothing I can do with you, we'll, we'll have to go our separate ways. But I was really happy, because I just didn't feel comfortable with him. I guess I wasn't ready at that time for what he was pushing me to do. But I get a call shortly after that, a few days after that, I get a call, and someone wants me to fly me to China because there's something called the Mr. World. I know you've, you've all heard of the, the Miss World. Of course, this is the Philippines, you know, all those pageants. Well, they were doing something similar for men, the people that did Miss World, and they were doing a Mr. World, and they called me and they said, we want you to represent the United States and be Mr. USA. They said it's not quite the same, same thing as the Miss World. They're doing it a little bit more like react, like Survivor, like a tough guy reality show, because they don't want to be soft and feminine. I said, okay, cool. I'd always wanted to visit China, and that was the perfect time, because someone else was going to pay for it. And not only am I going to get to visit China, I'm close to the Philippines, so after the taping of the show, I'll just book a ticket and fly to the, back to the Philippines for my third trip there. So I go to the Mr. World, and it's, I have a good time. I enjoy it for what it is. Even while I'm there, I'm enjoying China. It's all paid for, uh, but the whole time, I'm just thinking like, yeah, after I was telling all the other contestants after this, I'm going to the Philippines. This place is awesome, you gotta see it. So the, the thing is, I fly back to the Philippines, and I'm only in the, the country a month this time. This is my third trip. And in a short period of time, I started booking all these TV shows and doing all this cool stuff. But after a month, I'm like, okay, gotta go back to Hollywood and focus on that. Gotta get my career going. So I fly back, this is 2007. I immediately book a music video for this Mexican singer that was very popular named Jenny Rivera. She recently died in a plane accident. But I booked that, I played her her love interest in the video, and I started booking other gigs, and around this time, I started, I just get this urge to buy a video camera. I, had, I went to film school, but I never thought I'd do anything with it. I thought I'm gonna be an actor, that, that's my calling. But for whatever reason, I just got this strong urge, I need to buy a video camera, and I should make some, some videos myself. So I go out and I buy some basic video equipment, uh, this is before, I wasn't really thinking about YouTube at this time. All I knew is, for some reason, I had this desire to make videos. I, I get the basic equipment, and I started thinking back to 2006. I had a meeting with GMA Network, and me and my manager were in the waiting room, and they had posters on the wall of all the shows they were doing. One of them was called Mobile Cuisina, a cooking show. Well, in high school, I took a lot of cooking classes, and I, I say to my manager, you know, they should have me as a guest on that show. I'll come on, I'll cook something, it'll be really entertaining. And she says, well, mention that when we're in the meeting. In the meeting, I mentioned that, hey, you guys have a cooking show, I can, I can cook. You gotta have me on that show. I think they thought I was joking, because I was never on the show. So I thought back to that, it was something that happened a year previously, when I'm sitting around with my video equipment, and I was thinking, well, I wanna test out this equipment. What should I do? And then I remembered, well, I never did that cooking show when I was in the Philippines. And I also remembered I had a lesson while in film school in college. They taught us how to shoot a cooking segment. 
and I think I was actually the only one that paid attention. The teacher went over it real quick, everyone else was daydreaming or whatever, but I paid attention and it always stuck in my mind. I know how to shoot and edit that. So I thought, if I set up this equipment, I'm going to do my own Filipino cooking thing. And I thought, what do I have around the house? It turns out I had ingredients for a adobo. Oh. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing at the time. I didn't know how this was going to be a significant life changer for me. And I do this, I shoot really, I quickly shoot this video of how to cook adobo. I, put, I start a YouTube channel. I throw it up there and I look at it and I think, this is kind of cute, this is kind of funny. I don't think anyone's ever going to see this. But then something happened. Every day, thousands and thousands of people were watching it every single day. And I was trying to figure it out, man, why are people watching this? People were going crazy. And then like I was, people were writing me and saying, yeah, they're showing it on TV in the Philippines. And I'm like, they are? I was kind of thinking, why? I'm like, I'm like, it's good, but why are people going so crazy over it? It turns out I created my first viral video of it. And it was all accident. I didn't plan for this. That's probably part of why it became a hit. I wasn't trying to do something to be successful. I wasn't trying hard. It didn't have that factor. It just had that little bit of magic and surprise factor. So that becomes a hit. And then I'm thinking, there's something to this. All, all these calls are coming in about it. Even I had a Hollywood agent this time. This is 2008 now. My agent gets called in Hollywood and he says, you know, Travis, someone called me and they said they own some sort of Filipino cooking supply store. They said something about, you have some sort of cooking video. He didn't know anything about it. He said, you have some sort of cooking video and they want to hire you to be in one of their commercials. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I want to do it. And he, he, my agent, for whatever reason, he didn't really think it was going to be enough money for him or whatever to get his cut. That he didn't really pursue it and there was no interest. And it kind of ticked me off at him. But then I thought, you know, there is something to this video. I need to do a follow-up. So I started thinking seriously, but this time we got to go bigger and better. Sequels always have to be better than the original. And I created this video where it kind of parodies what I did in the first one. In this one now, it's kind of, it parodies it in terms of, now I'm like this famous cooking guy. I'm almost like a cooking superhero. And I did, it's called Salo Salo, but what's really interesting about this project is all the different people I brought together to do something to honor Filipino culture. We had white Americans working on it, African Americans working on it, we had a girl from Japan, we had Filipino Americans working on it. All these different types of people that never even thought about Filipino culture, I gathered and we produced something that's a tribute to Filipino culture. And who you know, maybe we can show it, Salo Salo. Dance presentation there. <laughs> yeah, but that was Salo Salo basically. I don't know Salo Salo. That was actually my first time taking film and being seriously. And it, of course it's crewed by what I'm doing today. What I'm doing today, of course, I'm, I'm a better filmmaker, but that still has charm that I think can't be replicated. At least that's my review of my own product. And I made that with the intention of this one's going to be even bigger. I'm making this specifically with Filipino television in mind. If they're showing that Adobo video, where they're going to show this, they're going to show this other one, and it's going to show people how much better I am than what they think. We're going to we're going to take things even further. Well, it turns out. No TV channels want to hear it for whatever reason. I don't think it fit any of the formats of the shows where they could just have a, a short segment where they play that. But I ended up putting it on YouTube and it got a lot of hits and people saw it and I'm proud of that. It was my first time taking filmmaking seriously and it got me thinking more about filmmaking. Because I did some other web videos but they were mostly silly things just for fun. And I started thinking as a filmmaker. And then I started doing more, and the more and more I got into video making, the less and less interested I got in acting. I just gradually started to focus less and less at, on acting, but I still started booking some interesting gigs. At the, end, at the end of 2008, I had a big week in my life. I booked a job doing a photo shoot with Lindsay Lohan for a prestigious fashion magazine, Harper's Bazaar. So I shot with Lindsay Lohan for two days, and it was a very big deal. And since I was with Lindsay Lohan, 
during this shoot. All the paparazzi were photographing us. Then on shows like Entertainment Tonight, they'd show me and Lindsay together. And I, that happened. Then a couple days later, I go into an audition. And since I just booked one big gig, there was, I felt no pressure on me. This was for a TV commercial for a show starring Courtney Cox called Dirt. I went into the audition. I just felt completely relaxed. I didn't feel desperate the way most actors feel. And because of that, and being at ease with myself and being relaxed, I booked the job. And then, so this is the same week. Two huge jobs in the same week. And when that week ended, I thought, oh, I guess I'm Mr. Hollywood now. It's the end of the year from now on out. From now on out, next year I'm gonna come back and I'm just gonna keep going up, up, and up, and I'm gonna be the next Hollywood big shot. That's what I was thinking. Well, in Hollywood, as in most things in life, a lot of the times you take three steps forward, two steps backward. That's kind of what happened. <laughs> I, I didn't end up booking a lot of other big jobs in the coming months, but I just kept focusing on video making. And these videos I was doing about the Philippines were popular, and this is while I was in America. I was making videos about the Philippines while in America. And a lot of people thought I was actually in the Philippines when we shot these, but no, I was in California. And I was getting so many requests for that, and the Philippines just was always on my mind. It was just something about it. I was just in love with the Philippines. So I ended up going back in 2010, and I figured maybe people will play Salo Salo, or I'll see what else happens while I'm there. I go back in 2010, first half of 2010. I make up my mind, I'm gonna get in the best shape of my life, I'm gonna work on my physical appearance, I'm gonna work on my mind, on my talent, and I'm just gonna make everything, I'm gonna do as best as I can. I'd also kind of, secretly, I'd been getting a little bit burned out on entertainment. I just, all I knew was I really loved video making. I didn't necessarily want to focus on the other aspects, but I made up my mind, and I had determination. 2010, I'm gonna work as hard as possible, I'm gonna see what I can do, and at the end of the year, let's see what happens. First half of 2010, I'm in the United States, and I start booking all kinds of jobs because I'm focused, I'm, de I'm determined, and I end up, at the end of the six months, I end up booking a movie. And it's a small movie, but it gives me a nice little paycheck. I've been putting money away all this time to go to back to the Philippines, but with this, booking this movie, it was another burst of money. It was gonna kind of pay for my trip, at least my flight and some other stuff. So I book a trip, and then I'm like, second half of 2010, I'm back in the Philippines, I'm seeing what I can do. All of a sudden I start booking a lot of shows. Some people take notice, some people don't. I, I wouldn't say I was quite mainstream yet, but I was ending up on a lot of talk shows, and there was a lot of interest in me. I was booking some good modeling gigs, having fun, shooting videos. I had a lot of success. At the end of 2010, I felt a little burned out. I thought, well, the year is over, I'm tired. I'm tired of working so hard on my career. I'm tired of always having to scrounge for the next gig, typical show business. So I had a good year both in the United States and the Philippines, but I flew, at the end of 2010, I flew back to the United States and I thought, I want to take some time off, rethink some things. I ended up dropping acting. I wasn't really thinking about it, but I kept video making. And I, I took a regular job just to kind of make ends meet, just because I want a steady paycheck. But throughout these next couple of years, I was always still thinking about the Philippines and how happy I was in the Philippines and about my experiences with Filipino people, about that warm, friendly, welcoming spirit that Filipinos have. So I came back to the Philippines last year in 2012, and this time before coming, I decided I'm going to focus on doing videos about the Philippines and Filipino culture and spreading that kind of love, and I thought, I don't know if anything will come out of this. I think something will, it might not be what I want or what I would expect, but I, I went back to the Philippines. First few months, I stayed in the Messiahs. I stayed in Calvayag City, a very lovely place. I did some really good videos there that got a lot of attention. I went back to Avila, Manila, and I started to do some TV stuff, and I kept doing my videos. GMA Network took notice, and I don't know how many of you guys saw this last year, I had a, sh a documentary air on GMA News TV. It's a show called Real Time, and they profiled me for an episode where I went and I lived with squatters on a floating house on a, on a dirty river in Manila. Now, how many of you have seen that episode? A couple? I don't watch GMA News TV. You don't watch GMA News TV? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. 
Well, getting back to the point, this was a big opportunity for me, and I never had an hour of television just for myself, but here's the thing. It was their idea to make me go live in the, the slums with squatters for a few days, in the dirtiest place they could find, and I don't have a problem showing poverty, but when, if you've seen my videos, the theme is, I'm not, I'm not afraid to show poor people, but there's going to be a silver lining on that cloud, and we're going to show happiness, and we're going to entertain people and make people smile. Well, the original concept for this show was to show this kind of, they had this very dark concept of, we're going to make the Philippines show how dirty it is and how gross it is, and I was trying to tell them, this kind of goes against my videos and why people like my videos, because my videos are about happiness, and they want to show this kind of how rough the life, life is in the Philippines, and I was telling them, I don't know if this is going to work, I, I think people are going to be angry at me because they're going to say, Kravis, you're a traitor. We thought that you honor Filipino culture and show how great the Philippines is. Here you're doing a TV show where you show how nasty the Philippines is. But I agreed to it with some hesitation. And we went, we shot it. I, didn't, I was always very apprehensive while shooting it about a lot of things. They shot me basically 24 hours a day. I got sick at the end of it. I got dingy and leptospirosis at the same time and spent a week in St. Luke's Hospital. I actually knew I was going to get sick before that because because of all my travels to the Philippines, I know the differences in terms of the germs. A lot of Westerners come to Asia and they get sick because they're not used to the same type of bacteria. One thing that's very different about the United States and the Philippines is health code standards. Here it seems like there's almost none of them. In the Philippines it's very, it's very pristine. You guys might not get sick to it because you're used to it. But it turns out I got sick a lot worse than I expected. So I ended up in the hospital. I eventually recovered. The show was about to air. And we were keeping in contact about them with the editing. They, then all of a sudden, I see a commercial air for the show, the first commercial. It's a very dark, and it starts out happy. But then they show me in the slums, and they show it becomes very dark and depressing. They color it kind of brownish and dark to make it look murky and ugly, make it look even worse than it was in reality. And they played sad music. And I was kind of, like, then I started to get a couple of emails. Travis, I see you're doing a show about the slums. Man, why are you making us look bad? And I thought that's, that's what was going to happen. And I tried to say, look, it wasn't my concept. And I was talking to the, head, the people editing. And it turns out, they called me and they said, you know what? You're actually right about this. We're trying to make it dark and nasty and kind of gritty, but that's not working. We can't edit it that way. It we, so it turns out they took my suggestion. Even though I went to the slums, they put a happier spin on it. And it turns out the show was the highest rated show on GMA News TV for that week and the highest rated episode of that show ever at that point. So it was a big success in terms of that. It didn't help me book any more TV shows, but I just kept working on my own videos, doing my own thing, putting into the world what I think should be put into the world, trying to influence people the way I think people should be influenced. And because of that, recently, I shot a movie a couple months ago, which comes out next week. It's called I'm Turkey Man, I Papa Rin. And this is a movie that deals with Filipino culture. It's about an American guy that marries a typical lower class Filipina and the comedy ensues. But I got this because of my hard work and my belief and always trying to show what's good about the Philippines. So that comes out next week. Now that I covered my history with entertainment and linking it with the Philippines, combining the best, my favorite things, oh, they have the showtimes up there, if you guys want to go see it. I haven't seen it myself yet. But it definitely combines my two loves, the Philippines and Filipino culture, with my love of entertainment and acting. Before this movie, actually, I'd given up on acting. I just kind of lost interest. But as I talked about previously, I always used to watch movie trailers and fantasize and replace that actor with myself mentally. I used to sit there in class and daydream about someday I'm going to be in movies. Or I used to go to the movie rental store and think about my movies. What I was really doing, I didn't realize it at the time, I was kind of hypnotizing myself. I was putting that in my subconscious, so even though consciously, a couple years ago I was thinking, I don't think I want to be an actor anymore, it's not for me, 
I'm just gonna move on. Somehow it went back to that because it was always in my subconscious. And then the opportunity came up where I got the call and they asked me to do that because of my videos that I was doing on YouTube. And of course, it wasn't just fate of randomly. God, I'd say God had a part in me getting that phone call and doing that. So that's how I got linked with the Philippines and entertainment. I linked them together. Without wanting to become an entertainer, I actually probably somehow wouldn't have ended up in the Philippines. And because of my work in the Philippines, it evolved the type of entertainer I am. But now let's talk about Filipino culture. A lot of people write me every day and they say, Travis, why do you like Filipino cultures? You like the mountains, you like the beaches, right? You like that stuff, you love Baraka, right? And I say to them, no. I don't care about that stuff. There's mountains all over the world. It's just a bunch of dirt. There's beaches all over the world. It's a bunch of ocean and water. Who cares? You know, that stuff is nice and you can enjoy it. But that ain't why I love the Philippines. I can go other places and get that. There's a reason why I keep coming back to the Philippines and why I've always been fixated with the Philippines. And that's because of the spirit of the people here. This is easily the friendliest country I've ever been to. Before shooting this movie, I went to Hong Kong for a couple days, and I sure found out, boy, they're sure not like Filipinos in terms of their spirit. I went and I sat down on a bench next to an old guy, kind of looked at him, and I smiled. Guy ignored me. I thought, well, that's not like that Filipino spirit. The Philippines is easily the most unique place when it comes to friendliness and welcoming. People come up to you on the street, and they'll treat you very well even if they don't know who you are. If they see you're a foreigner, they'll say, Hey, how are you? Where are you from? What's your name? I can't imagine a Filipino going to the United States, walking down the street, and someone, especially a little white kid, says, Hey, what's your name? Where are you from? Welcome. Ain't gonna happen in the United States. And I think that that's unfortunate. I think that that's something that Americans and American culture, I love America, I love American culture for the most part, but we could definitely learn from the Philippines and Filipinos. Definitely. Another question I get is, is the Philippines safe? I don't know how many emails I get on a daily basis people asking me, is the Philippines safe? And I told you about my bad incidents before. Also in 2010, I happened to get pickpocketed on the MRT. <laughs> it could happen. So, I mean, is the Philippines safe? Despite these few, these few bad experiences, I don't focus on it. It doesn't, it doesn't ruin things for me. I understand that these are isolated incidents and there's always a few bad people with the good people. Most Filipinos are overwhelmingly helpful, nice people. What do you guys think? Am I right or wrong? Right. However, I'd also like to... Is time okay? Okay. Well, I'd like to share some more with you guys, but we're running out of time. Do you guys know any ways that we could improve the Philippines before we go? Yes, we need to go. I'm suggestions. Real quick. Nicer kids. Oh, um, we're going to answer some questions. Would anyone like to ask some questions? Question. Come on, guys. Anything. Anything. I'm not a singer. I'm a man of many talents, and I'm warning you, singing is not one of those talents. So I'll do my best. Rasa sa big sa unang araw ng eskwela Taas kamay with confidence With the first day high That's all I know It's a very fruitful sharing and definitely, I ho and hopefully the students learned a lot. We invited Travis to speak for today's event because he's into Filipino culture and he loves Filipino culture. It's Travis, it's Travis, 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 Travis. Travis.